Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll say a few words of introduction, and then we can dive right into today's conversation. So first, I would like to thank and introduce our speakers today and just let them know what an honor it is for them taking the time to come together in conversation with all of us. So to begin, Steph Stefano Harney is an independent scholar and an honorary professor in the Institute of Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. He is the author of State Work, Public Administration, and Mass Intellectuality, published in 2002, along with numerous articles that traverse a range of topics addressing the ideology of meritocracy in Singapore, algorithms and logistics, and one of my personal favorites, an essay on the Russian anarchists Kropotkin and Rudy Giuliani in the wake of 9-11. He is also the author of numerous, or is one of the authors of numerous collective, collaborative projects, essays, and books, including the Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, co-written with Fred Moten and published in 2013, and their forthcoming work, All Incomplete, that hopefully we can get a feel for today. He is joining us from Brasilia, Brazil. Fred Moten is professor in the English, in the Department of Performance Studies at the Tisch School in New York University. In 2020, he was named a MacArthur fellow for, to quote their website, creating new conceptual spaces to accommodate emerging forms of Black aesthetics, cultural production, and social life, end quote. In 2017 and 2018, he published the trilogy, Consent Not to Be a Single Being, that upends, generates from within, and moves beyond Western categories of philosophy, aesthetics, and social life by reflecting on Black experience. Before that, he published In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, among numerous volumes of poetry, collaborations, and ongoing conversations, including the one today that with Stefano Harney and Michael Sawyer, we are privileged to be a part of. Fred is joining us from New York City. Michael Sawyer is currently an assistant professor of race, ethnicity, and migration studies and the English department at Colorado College. He was recently appointed associate professor of African American literature and critical and cultural studies at the University of Pittsburgh and will be joining their English department in the fall of 2021. He is the author of An Africana a Philosophy of Temporality, Homo Liminalis, published in 2000, in 2018, and more recently, Black-Minded, The Political Philosophy of Malcolm X, published in 2020, along with numerous articles and several exciting projects in the works, including a new book called The Door of Return, A Phenomenology of Blackness. As a colleague and a friend, Michael's intellectual generosity is boundless. In the last few years at Colorado College alone, he has created a vibrant intellectual and cultural atmosphere. Most recently, he debuted a sonic assemblage composed with Grammy um, award-winning multi-instrumentalist Nicholas Payton at the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center entitled Reclaiming Eight Minutes and 46 Seconds of Juju. Michael is joining us today from Colorado Springs. I'm Christian Sirace, an assistant professor of pol political science at Colorado College, and I'm thrilled to be facilitating today's conversation. Before getting started, I would also like to thank the Colorado College's political science department, the Africana Intellectual Project, and the McHugh Fund for sponsoring, supporting, and funding today's event. I would also like to thank Jessica Pauls, Naomi Trujillo, Jeff Hartman, and Don Herbst, for all of their support with the building and maintaining of the infrastructure for the event. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge that Colorado College, which is hosting this event, 
is located within the unceded territory of the Ute peoples, which was and is also home to the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. We will begin today's conversation with Stefano, Fred, and Michael, each taking turns elaborating on the concept and practice of fugitive aesthetics. After that, we will let the discussion flow where it may, and then in the last 30 minutes or so, open it to audience questions that you can type into the chat box. So without further delay, Stefano. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I, I got a few thank yous I'd, I'd like to make first, if that's OK. <clears throat> first, of course, to you, Christian, for bringing us together and inviting us. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to, to meet you, um, Professor Sawyer. This is the first time we've had the chance, but I'm very glad that we're in conversation today. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who's taken the time to join us. I can only imagine that there's a certain amount of Zoom fatigue uh, going around out there, and I'm really happy that, um, that you saved enough energy for us <clears throat> today. Um, I think at the outset, what I really wanted to acknowledge is that we suggested this title, um, Fred and I did uh, anyway, um, when we were asked um, as a tribute to our, our colleague uh, uh, and friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Nicole Fleetman, who um, has written a, a great book called Marking Time, uh, Art uh, in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Um, she and her book both speak for its, its themselves, but um, I wanted to say that um, they've been a great influence on me as, as have some of her earlier work and to acknowledge uh, her importance in what I'm thinking about. And I think what both Fred and I are thinking about uh, today. And I would just maybe jump off with one or two quick comments with regard to that and what she has opened up for me in thinking in this way. Um, the first, of course, is that we slightly changed it to a fugitive aesthetics to, to, to think a little bit more in line with the way um, uh, Fred and I uh, 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 conceive of, of, of um, uh, certain kinds of social life. Um, but but what, what, I, what I particularly take from her work is, is um, a series of questions that she raises. Uh, the first, of course, is uh, what, when has there not been an age of mass incarceration? Uh, the second, following Dylan Rodriguez, is, well, who's mass incarceration? Um, mass incarceration, as, as, as Dylan notes, um, covers up uh, the fact that there are some people who are mass incarcerated, not everybody. Um, so, so Nicole helps us to, to, to think uh, transhistorically and also think more specifically um, uh, in her work um, through through those ideas. Also, I think that she raises the question of the inside and the outside of the carceral um, and 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 how much that can really uh, stand um, when in a sense uh, we could say that um, the carceral um, is wherever we find uh, blackness in particular. Uh, but indigeneity and many other forms um, of, of fugitive life that, uh, that call forth the carceral. Um, and therefore, in a sense, we could say that, that, that the carceral aesthetic is, is the aesthetic of blackness. We could say the carceral aesthetic is the aesthetic that is pretty much the aesthetic of, the, of America, uh, of the Americas, I could say, <clears throat> also sitting here in Brazil. Um, and that that carceral aesthetic is also one which implies all the time uh, escape. Uh, it implies all the time uh, a, a, uh, a resistance and a rebellion to, to, the, to the, the carceral that chases it. Um, and yet at the same time, um, it's in the nature of the fugitive that there is no escape. Uh, and it's in the nature of fu fugitivity that this cannot be reduced to an individual strategy that might in fact, appear to have led to some kind of escape. So all of these um, ideas come to me largely because of her work. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to get to it yet, I, 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 start, I strongly recommend it. 
So I'd, I'd like to stop there just with that uh, tribute and then uh, see where our conversation can go from there. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just pausing because I'm imagining some new technology for Zoom in which there's actually like a plunger mute section. So instead of not having any sound at all, you can come out with some kind of Bubba Miley kind of Ellington band thing or something. Um, sound effects. Anyway, um, you know, and, and that plunger effect uh, would probably correspond to something that would something like what we might call a fugitive sound. Um, which I guess I'll get back to in a minute, but mainly I wanted to begin by um, echoing Stefano, like I always do, uh, in thanking you, Christian, and in thanking you, Michael, for 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 setting this up and for allowing us to to hang out and talk with y'all and everybody else today. Um, I'm always glad to have a chance to do stuff with with my old friend. So. Um, and we're far away from each other now, so I appreciate this. Um, I, I, you know, and uh, and I and I'm very thankful for Stefano mentioning uh, Nicole Fleetwood, who, who's a friend and who's done such extraordinary work um, in thinking through this whole relationship between fugitivity and carcerality, in in in, in visual art. Um, I think the the way that that we maybe first approached the question of fugitivity with regard to the aesthetic was by way of music, which is to say by way of a kind of relay in thinking about music that goes through a whole bunch of different people. It goes through a whole bunch of different critics and a whole bunch of different musicians, but maybe most directly for us, kind of a relay that went from Amiri Baraka to, to Nathaniel Mackey and, and definitely kind of maybe situated most immediately in relation to, you know, the intensity and, and the, 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 the depth with which Mackey has taken up this term fugitivity in all throughout his writing, but, but especially in a, in a wonderful essay called Conte Moro, um, in which he talks about you know, a kind of Afro-Andalusian sound um, that first moves in a kind of relay, you know, from Southern Europe to, to North Africa, um, as if those were actually two separate things. And then, um, and, then, and then spreads out from there, you know, through the, the logistics and the logisticality of the, of the, of the African slave routes. Um, and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, anyway, we what what Mackey's talking about kind of has to do with the whole notion of muting, or maybe in this instance, mutation, with 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 a kind of with a sound whose supposed givenness and whose supposed natural order is transformed, um, partly as a function of you know creative disruption and and. And, and, and what one might call, you know, refusal of, of, of normativity, if, if not of norms. And on the other hand, it's obviously also therefore a function of, of duress or a resistance to duress, uh, a desire to, uh, to, to, to move out, um, to, to leave, um, um, and also a desire, uh, you know, to, to escape. Um, and maybe even a desire to escape the systemic relationship between slavery and freedom in the first place. Um, and, and that, that aesthetic, you know, it sort of animates, you know, Afro diasporic sound, um, all over the world. Um, it, it, it strikes me that it was already given in Africa in ways that allow us to raise some important questions about politics or or maybe the alternative to politics there you know that that predate the catastrophe of the slave trade but certainly it also postdates that catastrophe and it in it, it's manifest in in a in a range of musics that uh, that we often talk about you know with regard to uh beauty and enjoyment 
but in ways that we now have to always acknowledge that that beauty and that enjoyment is, um, you know, infused with, and at the same time also immersed in, you know, terror. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, that's what comes to my mind in, or at least initially in thinking about the, the phrase fugitive aesthetics. And, um, and I'm happy to have a chance to, to talk about all of that more with, with you guys and, and with everybody else who's, who, who, who's here. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Over to you, Michael. Uh, just like everyone else, I want to echo just how uh, thankful I am for this opportunity, particularly to thank Christian and the uh, political science department for allowing me to participate and also to Fred and Stefano for in a sense letting me sit in with them, right? It's like the highest and best honor for musicians to be able to sit in with other people. So I really appreciate that. Also to uh, have the opportunity really to to think carefully about just what we we put on the table, this notion of what fugitivity and carcerality appear like. And so what I've done is I tried to put together so I could stick to the chart nonetheless to, to put together a short thing to kind of situate the way I want to approach uh, my thinking on this, and I call it uh, just enough, just enough. And it starts with kind of four epigraph. The first is just enough of snow to make a strutting black cock unbelievable. Richard Wright, haiku number 523. The second is serious music is a dead art by Henry Pleasance. The third is practice. We're talking about practice, Allen Iverson. The fourth is living just enough, just enough for the city, Stevie Wonder. This brief introduction on my part to this conversation is bound up with these four epigraphs and is more so occupied rather than preoccupied with the lightness or the darkness of Miles Davis that I will call an exemplar of what I want to call a bearable lightness to blackness that announces the opening of a fugitive aesthetic while at the same time stretching to the horizon of that possibility. When I reference Miles here, I'm doing so by way of a conversation between James and Tume and the late Stanley Crouch. Crouch had drawn attention to himself by asserting to whoever would listen that Miles production of the 70s was aesthetically worthless and the inevitable product of selling out to the industry. And Tume, and this is the term that orders my thinking here, wants to introduce technical exhaustion as the true operating condition that Krauts wants to reduce to creative exhaustion. And Tume gets the concept from Henry Pleasant's assertion that European classical music suffers from technical exhaustion, aesthetic decay and social obsolescence. Hence the epigraph here from the text, The Agony of Modern Music, insisting that, quote, serious music is a dead art, close quote. And Tume corrects the record by explaining that the turn to electronic music that offends the sensibilities of Crouch was about the need to produce new sounds and colors. I'm accepting in Tume's argument via Miles and Pleasance, but wonder if technical exhaustion on the part of the listener is at least as relevant as the limits a master reaches on any given platform. It is possible that what a particularly culturally educated subject can produce with a trumpet in service of rejection of that context will necessarily be in excess of the cognitive state versus the cognitive potentiality of those who can only listen and not hear to the point that some sounds will be rendered invisible. Following Fred here, I read Nathaniel Mackey is dealing with this phenomenon when the novel from a broken bottle traces of perfume emanate, he writes, quote, nonetheless, she was singing, dealing in sounds which were audible only to the mind, frequencies beyond conventional hearing, one understood that what she was up to was a dry run, futuristic, torturously utopic, a not yet articulable address, an envoy. She sent her song into the world, but did so with the understanding that the conditions which were truly bringing into being had yet to be met, close quote. With this in mind and considering the theory and practice of a fugitive aesthetic, I'm drawn to the difficult conclusion that the conditions have not yet been met for, he to, for me to hear what I'm listening to. And now I'm thinking about walking quickly down a path trying to catch up to a figure receding into the twilight who is sometimes beyond sight or hearing because they are around a corner. Ultimately, I realize that I'm always already following Ellison's hibernating Jack the Bear who reveals, quote, I've been boomeranged across the head so much that I now can see the darkness of lightness, close quote. Simply put, I've wondered utterances that echo around our present that I haven't tuned in to hear that, again, still chasing Ellison's Jack, who asked of the reader, quote, who knows but that on the lower frequencies I speak for you, close quote. And now I'm thinking about Stevie Wonder's just enough as exhaustion, technical and subjective in the sense of just barely as opposed to the possibility of having something in reserve and only using what is necessary. There's nothing that remains here. 
Stevie Signal says by the title that excises the just enoughs in the song that lands on black consciousness like the just enough of Richard Wright's haiku. One just enough is not enough just enough. The double just enoughs are absorbed by the living barely and the city barely to render their presence in the title superfluous and redundant. Living for the city in this perception is always already understood to be just enough, just enough. And now I'm thinking about the fugitility of Alan Iverson who was talking about practice to a bunch of reporters who think it is all about basketball when AI is talking about life and more properly death and what he sees, says it means to bleed, cry and hurt. His exhaustion and fear are palpable yet opaque to the symbol sports columnists who can't see the forest of black death for the trees of black suffering. They can't hear the lamentations because they are too busy listening to the silence of the court that has been vacated for the summer after an ignominious playoff loss that has drowned out the black noise of a funeral procession that is kind of darker than blue. AI tries to tell him, quote, I'm upset. I'm upset for one reason, man, because I'm here. I lost. I lost my best friend. I lost him and I lost this year. Everything is going downhill for me as far as just that, as far as my life. And I'm dealing with this right here, close quote, bleeding, crying, and hurting. And they are talking about practice. AI has blurred, the point of in, to, has blurred to the point of indistinction, the game, a game, practice, life, and death, or more precisely, the living he does is just enough, just enough to hold all of them together to be able to just barely hide in plain sight that the murder of his best friend is a loss that guts him because there's no practice for that game because that game is life death. And they all resonate in the lower register that I'm struggling to tune in before I tune out the blackness of the strutting black cock that is barely black against the just enough snow. The contingency of life Stevie describes in the city where you can barely make a dollar and his mother's hardly paid a penny and his barely black sister is conditionally sure enough pretty. Here is, the, here is where the music has reached a point that our ears trick us into believing that serious music is dead when it's really the case that no amount of listening under conditions that have not been met will allow us to hear the song around us because a fugitive aesthetic demands of us an excess of fugitive cognition. Thanks. Uh, um, thank you all for your um, wonderful um, powerful, poignant introductions, which is a lot to um, process. Um, if I may, I'm just going to ask one question to try to um, uh, move the conversation uh, forward to, um, you know, Stefano, you're talking about the nature of um, fugitivity as being no escape from and also not an individual strategy. And Fred, you're talking about it also as a refusal of normativity. And um, I'm still actually trying to process uh, Michael's powerful statement about the utterances that echo around us with the conditions not having yet been met in which that listening becomes possible. So the question I, I want to, to ask is um, the relationship between fugitivity and refusal, or as Fred, as I know you've put it in several or through across a lot of your work, or refusal of refusal, premised on the idea that Black social life refuses what has historically been refused and withheld from it the degraded categories of politics, individuality, or possessive individuality, citizenship, and humanity. If I understand it correctly, drawing from the work of Fannie Lou Hamer, among others, both you and Stefano argue that the refusal of the refusal opens up onto the fugitivity or these fugitive publics and the improvisation of social life and Michael, in your book on Malcolm X, Black Minded, you also address the revolutionary potential of the refusal of state authority and recognition that is simultaneously living within the state's sovereign geography, subject to racist policing and violence, and also how that refusal um, you know, um, elicits, or I think as Stefano put it uh, in his introductory remarks, also calls into being those um, impulses of, uh, of, of carcerality. So I just, um, as by way of my own introduction, um, 
I'd love if we could all discuss how fugitivity is both an escape and not an escape, or can it escape, as Michael puts it um, from an interview I listened to, uh, the deadly dialectical relationship with white supremacy? Um, or to approach the question from another way, could we also come up with other generative scenes and figures of fugitive aesthetics that help us visualize this liminal and topographical and yet um, generative space? Okay, thank. I hope I hope that I hope that made sense. Um, thanks. I'm sure there's no need for us to keep the same order, so I don't mean to to call that into order by by starting again now. But I just uh, I just had to say uh, to Michael that uh, Fred and I have shared um, Iverson's. Uh, press conference, uh, that very press conference that you um, that you you weave into that that wonderful opening on on several occasions to try to really think about without having a an analysis of the way he keeps enunciating the word practice in that. Right. I'm sure you'll recall, right? How he is, and he's like, and you're talking about practice, right? And he keeps. There's a kind of reiteration with it. So there's all these kind of reverberations from this, this moment of practice, which run the entire, well, I think they might run the entire gamut from, from him belittling practice to him exalting practice, you know, all in the same, uh, all in the same performance, let's say. Um, uh, maybe I don't even want to call it a performance, all in the, all in the same interview, um, uh, where on the one hand, practice becomes like, everything, you know, in a lot of ways, I think. Uh, it becomes everything in the sense that, you know, first of all, you think he's saying to people, you know, what the fuck do you think I've been doing my entire life? And you want to right. talk to me about practice? I mean, what else do you think I do every goddamn day, right? You know, but also what you start to feel well, practice is something a lot bigger than getting to the, getting to the practice uh, courts, right? You know, when he's using the word. And then on the other hand, of course, he's, you know, he senses that practice is tied to 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 his to his exploitation and and ultimately, despite you know um, his status, to somehow also to his denigration. Um, and he does all of that inside those repetitions and those words. And and I guess I was thinking of that because when Fred was talking. Um, and talking about how, when he and I came up, what, what were the places where we started to get fugitive aesthetics, you know, kind of fixed into our, <clears throat> into our being, uh, you know, in the other ear from that, because I spent many years in, in the Caribbean, in, in Trinidad and in Barbados and Eastern Caribbean, English speaking Caribbean, I, I always had soca and Calypso uh, in which repetition, uh, just as in the blues is very central. Um, but of course, repetition just doesn't ever sound the same as it keeps going. And it starts to bring in these opposites, starts to bring in these contradictions. So I, I just wanted to note that I recall watching that with Fred and, and just watching it explode uh, as, a, as, a, as an interview, you know, that um, uh, never let me think about practice again the same way. And Fred and I were at that point already trying to think about everything we do as practice um, and and trying to think about um, trying to think about never being finished and trying to think about uh, avoiding the productivity, the development, the 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 um, the, the excellence that you know um, we're all called to. Um, inside and outside of academia. So I'm very, I'm very happy to hear you um, situated in the middle of your, your opening talk, Michael. No, I appreciate that. Uh, it's one of those things where when it happened, right, it was, it was framed as being almost funny the way you're saying, right? Because it was the sports media picked it up and it was like, listen to Alan Iverson talk about practice. And you're right, right? The word has so much weight in that moment and literally it's it's days after his best friend had been murdered and he's also talking about the inability to get himself to the place to do the thing right and at the same time he's got to perform this and, and then they're talking about trading him from the team 
So everything is happening to him at that same moment, right? And and, it, and I think I agree with you, right? He's blurred to the point of indistinction whether practice is worthwhile or or worthful in a certain worthless in a certain way, right? That he doesn't need to anymore. But then he seems to be saying that everything he's doing is just practice for something else. But he's not sure what that next else thing is going to be because he's in an unstable condition at that point from perspective of his relationship to life and death and his relationship to the team and basketball, which gives him life. And so, you know, to me, it was, it's like, and I really had, had been waiting for an opportunity to think with people about it because it's one of those iconic moments that's bound up with Allen Iverson as a type of who I think set the, set the standard both visually and uh, probably performatively for what the modern NBA is about, right? A kind of refusal, like his refusal to wear suits, his refusal to, you know, do whatever he's told, right? And, and you know, he's sitting there with this, you know, with this white t-shirt on and, and you know, a Boston Red Sox vintage hat. And, you know, he's got about $500,000 in cash in his pocket. He's just doing Allen Iverson, right? But he's also in a great deal of pain at the same time. And so I thought it would be interesting to think about that as, as exemplar of a fugitive aesthetic in that kind of a way. And the fact that the, what I'm saying is that then the audience or the people listening can't even hear what he's saying if they're not tuned into it properly to hear what the things are that he's saying that really matter. So that's why I thought it would be helpful. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing also how you, you all take stock of it as well, some more information about that. Yeah, I mean, I, that, well, I'm, I'm thinking about that moment now also filtered through a couple of different kind of great works of art that that I've had a chance to um, to, to witness that that take up that that moment, um, which is to say, I guess you could say that. Well, it's interesting, you know. I I was gonna just jump right there and say, well, you know, what what Iverson did is also a great work of art, but I don't know. I don't know if that's right, you know. In other words, I I don't know if what he did requires that that little moment of exaltation, which might in fact reduce what he did. Um, I, I certainly believe it was aesthetic, um, but it might be aesthetic in a way that precisely, you know, escapes, you know, the, the, the carceral frame of the artwork, you know, in a certain kind of way. Um, but anyway, and, and maybe that's also true of the so-called works of art I'm thinking of too, but, but there's a great poet named Pete Moore who, in a book called Zippers and Jeans does this extended kind of riff on practice, on practice in the game that is, is just beautiful. And I, I always hear, you know, uh, you know, Alan, Alan Iverson's, you know, uh, Tidewater Virginia accent morph into Pete Moore's sort of Memphis accent when he, when he does that, uh, I wish I had a website or a, a recording to point y'all to with him reading those poems. Um, but I'm also thinking of uh, these two extraordinary filmmakers and sound artists named Saul E. Chasky, who who done these amazing kind of uncategorizable film works in which, among other things, they take up that that press conference too. And again, it's through the intensification of the repetition that's already there in, in Iverson's speech, you know, which is a repetition that we could also talk about as practice and also as practicing, um, you know, or something like maybe what Wilson Harris would call an infinite rehearsal, uh, an infinite rehearsal for a, a, you know, for a, for an event or a performance um, that that is always being refused, that is always being fled in a certain sense. So, so maybe you could talk about it as a performance, um, but you would have to spell it P-R-E-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E. -E. Um, you could pronounce it the same way if you want to, but that, that sense of a prefatory thing, um, a performance, it never happens. The form never comes into its own. Um, and I guess it, within the framework of that, the way, the way I always wanted to hear it, you know, and, and I was always, you know, able to hear it that way just from talking with, with Stefano about it was, is that it was almost like he was saying, who the hell are y'all to be talking about practice? 
what the, what, what the fuck, do, what do y'all know about practice? Y'all talk about the game, but don't, don't talk about practice. You know, I don't want to hear you talking about practice because practice is not your purview. Practice is not the, the portfolio of, of, of ignorant sports writers, right? What y'all can do is to talk about the, you know, the simple brutal calculation of wins and losses. Y'all can talk about points. Y'all can talk about who scored the most, okay? And the game is within that brutal accounting, okay? But don't you be talking about practice. You talking about practice? No, you talk about the game. I, I'll, I'll talk about practice. Cause I'm talking about an existential, you know, structure which cannot be held within the brutalist accounting of wins and losses. And really on a deeper level, can't be held within the, you know, the, the carceral opposition of life and death. Okay. It's it's deeper than that. It's it's more than that. Um, it's bigger than that, you know. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's very generous, you know, in a way, uh, of him to elaborate it so fully, you know, um in, in their presence, you know. Um and, and, I, and I actually think I agree with you, Michael, that it is about a different understanding of the game, you know, in ways that that I'm still trying to come to grips with. Because when I when I talk about basketball with my with my with my eldest son who loves the game, he thinks about it in a totally different way than me. Um, and I think in a more advanced way, you know, because I fall back on the accounting of wins and losses. You know, I'm like, he's like, who's your favorite player? I mean, you know, I, my tendency when I think about who's a greater player is I think, you know, how many, how many chips they got, how many rings. He's, he's beyond that, that accounting, right? He's <laughs> something that Nate Mackey always writes. He's with, 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 when it comes to Lorenzo Moten, basketball is a question of the, the eternity of style. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I think, yeah, you know, Iverson is is, you know, in 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 many ways, he's 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 the he's he's like you say, he's a prophet, you know, of of that um, of that aesthetic disruption of the game, you know. Uh, so, no, and I wonder because there's a there's a middle term too. It's warming up, right? So somewhere between practice and the game is the warm up. And it and it, and it and it occurs to me this happened when when Pharaoh Saunders was here, right? And I had I spent like three days with Pharaoh, right, just being around him. And every day he would stop to practice. And I was like, what is Pharaoh practicing, right? Like, is but then that was significantly different than the warm up because when they were getting ready for the performance, he played things the day before. Soundcheck had nothing to do with what he was going to do the night of the performance, right? So there was this very firm separation between practice, warming up and the performance, right? And so then it occurs to me that, that, and like you're saying, right, that's not a, those, those two previous spaces are not spaces that the public is necessarily allowed into, or even if they are into it, can't un understand what's happening because it doesn't resolve itself properly, right? He doesn't finish the song, he doesn't finish the phrase, he does, he's playing around with the chords in ways that don't necessarily resolve themselves in, in, in the way we understand the resolution of, of wins and losses or the middle beginning or end of a song, right? So it, it occurs to me that warming up also has to be taken stock of, right? And what Alan Iverson is doing is, and I think you're right, because there's a point when one of, the, one of the basketball writers, he asks him if he ever played basketball. And he says, yeah, and Alan says, I don't know you as no player. He's like, I know you as a columnist, but I don't know you as a player to be talking to me about basketball. And the guy's like, you know, the pushback from the, the reporter is, well, shouldn't I be able to write about it? He's like, sure, but I'm asking you what you know about it. And at the level we're talking, this is helpful with your proposing, Fred, is that at the level of practice, it's it's the door's closed, right? The gym is empty and it's just the coaches and the players doing whatever it is they need to do to get ready to, to perform in front of other people. So it's it's a it's a performative space that that is is in many ways outside of the economy, the way you're pointing out, right? The economy of the game that has to be played. But it's necessary. I mean, I, and I, I also think, well, it, you know, it does raise the, the question concerning the status of the game and, and what it's, 
what its importance is, you know, um, in the same way that you, you know, I, I mean, it, I wish, I wish I had, I, I, I wish I could have been there with you, you know, when you were talking to Pharaoh Sanders, talking with Pharaoh Sanders, because one of the questions I would ask, you know, would be, well, what, what's the actual status of the, the gig, the concert? Like, where, where does it fit within, within your general practice? And then there's also a question of, well, you know, where does practicing fit within your general practice, you know? Um, but but it's like, uh, I, I don't think it's a matter of, of, I don't even think it's a matter ultimately of valorizing practice over the game in, in, in something, in a reversal that seems already embedded in what Iverson is saying. I, it's just more like, you know, how, how all that stuff fits together is just, you know, completely outside the narrow framework that that this or that sports writer, um, you know, you know, it's not just to denigrate all sports writers either. There's this guy, y'all ever read Bill Simmons? Um, he wrote this big, huge ass book called The Big Book of Basketball. And it begins with this story of, I don't, I don't know if, I mean, we're, we're old, Mike, so you have to give us, you know, a break, <laughs> but we actually remember, you know, the, the, those battles between the, the Pistons, the bad boy Pistons and the Celtics to see who would get out of the East, you know, to play the Lakers back in the, in the mid the late eighties. And, 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 and the Detroit team was good for three, was good enough to win a title for three years before they did but they just couldn't beat the Celtics. It was always some bad play, some uh, inbounds pass being stolen, some something. And there's this great interview at the end of one of those games with Isaiah Thomas. And he, and he says something like, it's like Magic and Bird just have a secret of how to win that they, don't, they, they won't tell anybody. And I don't know what it is. And this Bill Simmons, Years later, after Isaiah retired, runs up on him in a in a hotel swimming pool in Las Vegas, and asks him what the secret is. Okay, and and he says, "Really, you really want to know? I don't think you're ready to know." I mean, Isaiah completely, you know, he doesn't freeze him, but he basically says, "I I don't I don't know if you're ready to know this." But at the end of it all, Isaiah finally warms up to the guy and says, "The secret." is that it's not about basketball, <laughs> right? And, um, and he goes on to elaborate, you know, you know, you know but, but the point is, is, it feels to me like what you're suggesting too, Michael, is that, yeah, th there's something deeper going on than, 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 than can be contained even within the game of basketball, you know, uh, let alone any individual game. And that this is what, and it's almost like Iverson is saying that, not to the sports writer, but to us, that the sports writer simply becomes, you know, both, it's under the duress of his questioning that that he bypasses him in order to try to say something to us, you know. Yeah, I think to and then to kind of return to what Christian asked, I think about this notion of refusal, right? Or and what I'm trying to do is to think about and this Chris, some of this goes back to your 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 talk at MoMA, right? The on on uh we talk about Betty, right? And the notion of refusing to accept freedom and return to slavery, right? And the question I had for you in that type of fugitive aesthetic, I'm also curious about the space that allows for that type of performance is a particular type of spatiality, right? Because the, the, the space that allows for the performance of non-performance is a particular type of performative space. And it seems that because of the relationship, this gets to this question about how we say maybe even refusing the, the relationship between slavery and freedom, right? It also seems to me to be refusing the, the, the possibility of having a space where slavery and freedom can exist. In, in concert with, with each other or in opposition to each other. Because to that extent, then there's no place for that energy to go, right? It was only because Kentucky still exists 
that the performance of non-performance of freedom was possible. And so that's what I was interested in kind of hearing if, if you can help me understand how that relates itself to your, your argument about what Betty is up to in refusing this question of freedom, if that helps. Uh, just very, very briefly, because I'm already talking too much. You already got it right in, in your opening statement, which is, you know, she, she was playing some music that we can't quite hear yet. Yeah. So, <laughs> but we, but we try, you know, trying to listen, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you have to be one of the most cruel people in the world to try to tell slaves and the descendants of slaves that they shouldn't be fixated on freedom, right? Unfortunately, our, our situation is such that, that we require an aesthetics of just such cruelty. So um, precise, you know, you have to be cruel enough to recognize the intensity of that relation, you know, um, which one cannot simply opt out of between freedom and and enslavement, you know. Um, actually, there's there's one person I think who's cruel enough to have really done a, a tremendous amount of work on on and the excavation of just that that relation, and that's Orlando Patterson. <laughs> you know, um, you know, the, the trouble with part of the part of the, the terrible, you know, sort of glorious trouble with slavery and social death um, is that you have to read the freedom book, too. Right. Um, and uh, there's this great, long, like 125 page interview um, with him. That, that David Scott does in Small Acts. And, and that's kind of where I think he's beginning to work through that. And what he had been working through it before, even slavery and social death and, and various things. So, um, but Dom Getachew has a beautiful um, review of, of, of Patterson's new book on, on Jamaica, the, the Confounding Island in the nation and she she talks about that and works through those things so anyway i'm 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 going on mute now i mean the thing with with orlando's the freedom book is it always struck me that it's, it's part one right we haven't seen the other parts of it right so when you write it's like they didn't call world war one world war one because they thought it was the great war so he obviously is thinking of something else has to happen, but it hasn't arrived yet, right? It's like, and it seems to me it's the same, it's performing the same question of the relationship to freedom that he can't quite figure out what part two is supposed to be, but knows there has to be something else. And I, I don't know when part two is gonna appear or whether he's he's abandoned the project or not, but it seems to me that when you put out a book and call it part one and people have been waiting, what is it now? 30, 40 years for part two? There's something going on uh, deeply related to the inability to resolve that question in a certain kind of way. One of the things that's been helpful, again, <clears throat> Michael, about your opening and about this conversation is that, um, you know, Fred and I get asked a lot about uh, what we meant when we used this term study a lot of years ago now. Uh, and we thought of it for a long time in relationship to, to, to practice. But one of the things that, um, that has, has come out here, which is really nice, is that you know, we're always uh, in a situation where study is said, like practice, to come before the game. And in this case, the game is, you know, actually taking the test, actually graduating, actually doing the peer review, actually, you know, uh, uh, proceeding in the profession, proceeding, in, you know, to graduate, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so one of the things that we've always tried to insist is that it's, it's not 
it's not that study replaces these other things. Uh, it is that it undermines them. It is that it scrambles them to some extent, just as we see with, with Iverson's uh, interview. Um, but more than that, it's, you know, when, we're, when we talk about study, what we're, what we're after, I think, Michael, which you bring very clearly into view, we're after practicing the conditions that would allow us to hear something or, or would allow us to, to see something or would allow us to be with some people that right now we can't be with or right now we can't hear or right now we, we can't see. So, so, so we wanna to try to remove study from a, from a position vis-a-vis um, -vis some other activity, the performance, uh, the gig, et cetera, the game, um, and place it instead in that other realm of, of, uh, of a constant resistance, a constant um, uh, fugitive uh, choreography that um, allows us to open up, in a way, a social space, however temporary, um, however inadequate, that allows us to, uh, to create the conditions for a minute for a day of being able to hear something uh, or see something or be with people. Um, and, you know, another word for another phrase for, for that is, is simply, you know, black social life, because that's what black social life does all the time. Um, and, and so it's really helpful to think about the Iverson um, piece in your intro in terms of trying always to, because part of what it means to, to, for, to study is to try to explain what you're doing, um, either to yourself or each other or people who ask. In the case of me and Fred, it's thought lots of times it's people asking. And that's part of the practice too. And, and, the, and somehow the answer or the conversation ought to be part of um, an experiment, failed experiment, uh, a pre-experiment, in the creating of the conditions where one might hear uh, or one might see or one might um, one might be with me so be with people so it occurs to me um, that that by scrambling practice in certain ways uh, and by saying also in what is a kind of reversal I think you're right to say that when you're talking about the relationship with the journalist I think it's right to say that that Iverson challenges him and, 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 and in a way that we would want to see in study where, uh, you know, people who question our, our, our practice of study, it has to be asked, well, what would they know about it? They always finish it, you know, they graduate, you know, uh, you know, they publish, uh, whatever, right? You know, so um, there's a way in which I think that it's important to insist that, you know, maybe study like practice is something that you know, um, people have a kind of uneven access to it according to, to their histories and according to, to, their, to, to how much practice they're doing of it. Um, and, and it means that we, we can't, it means Fred and I, for instance, are even more unable to say what it is, but it also means other people, <clears throat> especially people who might be in a more regulatory frame um, are, are, are also, even more unable to know what it is. Um, they, they haven't been there, they don't do it. Um, and yet they presume um, to know how it fits in with the, the payoff for them, uh, let's say. So I, again, it's very generative to think about it that way. If I may try something out being very unpracticed and you know, running down the court and tripping over my shoes, which are probably untied. Um, uh, this conversation um, brought to mind something I've been fixated on. And for the last several years, I've been studying uh, Mongolian. Um, and uh, in the Mongolian language, uh, the word to study, sorokh, uh, the root of the word is actually the formation and practice of habit. Right. And then on this word, actually, all kinds of other things get accreted and actually ideology spins out of this word. And so does the modern word for advertisement. 
So you have ideology being uh, a combination of words for perception as well as for practice and study, er, perception and study and habit formation and advertisement being a kind of nominalization of that. But what's really interesting to me is the word education is actually a verbalization of the word to be human. So the noun human gets verbalized, and that means to educate. And so what I started thinking about is education as separate or different then from study or the root of study being this practice, this habit, this ongoingness that can kind of resist the ways in which certain modes of the human start to accrete and get reproduced with all of the racialization, with all of the class differentiation, with all of the kind of sorting or meritocracy that goes into that education. Uh, so I'm, I'm riffing here. I, th this could be making no sense whatsoever, and I'm okay with that. Um, but what made me think then, and this is uh, the question I'd like to ask, and, and it could be also very simple, but I'll throw it out there. So if education is a kind of mimesis or a kind of trying to get right the normative forms, then practice is the departure or the fugitive escape from that kind of mimetic entrapment. Or maybe I'm just riffing from, I was listening to a talk uh, on YouTube that Fred gave where I think you used the term, the sad, imita the sad imitation of normative categories. Um, so can we think about prax practice as a form of the refusal of specific modes of education that force us that, 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 that reproduces kind of idea of the human that is actually exclusive in its ostensible universality. And if that made no sense, please feel free to ignore my question and talk about other things. <laughs> so, um, or to rephrase it, you know, practice is different, right, than mimesis, or is it in opposition or orthogonal to that? I'm not sure if this answers your question, Christian, but it might, the question was received for me here in Brazil. Um, is, uh, it's been a momentous 24 hours here. Um, as some of you probably read in the international press, Lula's been um, freed essentially from his conviction to run for office. Lula and, part, and parts of his party have roots in turn in base communities and are related in turn to the great Paulo Freire, who is, who is from here, for whom there was a kind of connection between education and, hum, and the human uh, and humanism. Um, and Fred and I are, you know, we're old kind of Freire heads. I mean, he was a, he was a hugely significant person in, for us in university and ever since. But I think we've also always been kind of practicing a separation of, of, of these things. And, and one of the things that, one of the reasons that we might use study rather than education was to, you know, is to, is to, is to try to make a break from the idea that, that the goal is to be, become the human um, and instead to, to, to question that category entirely for, for its history uh, and probably an inevitable connection to a certain kind of um, disastrous individuation, uh, culminating in the individual who is the, the, you know, to whom freedom is attached, to whom, you know, who emerges through education, et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I suppose that um, Where you know where where we really have to depart from education is is precisely, you know, um, at that point where if you click right now on uh, Columbia College's opening website or websites of any any college that I've ever been at or Fred, you know, the, the story on the front page is a story of the becoming human uh, of every student. Um, and that's just the story that we want to break with because the becoming human of the student is the dehumanization or the destruction of everything else or worse, 
the, the, the inhabitation of everything else with humanness. Um, so, um, so you're, I mean, I'm only catching part of your questions. I know nothing about Mongolia, uh, sadly, but I, or, or, or the language, but I, but I felt it here in Brazil in a very specific way. As we now, once again, enter the political arena, you know, on the left, but at the same time, do it, do so with all the problems of politics, of the human, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's no answer to it. But when I, I think when we're talking about study, we're talking about an active process of taking apart anything like the individual and of helping each other fall apart in the face of the call of the human, which again is something that, you know, you can't, just as Fred was saying about freedom, you know, it's in a way I shouldn't even say that, you know, we shouldn't be human, right? Because um, I've had the opportunity more than most to, you know, live that fantasy. Um, but nonetheless, it's how I feel. I mean, I, I well, maybe, maybe we could talk about this um, by way of, of the beautiful music that y'all were playing at the outset, which I think was Joe McPhee, right? Um, nation time. And, and I was thinking maybe one way to think about it or one way to come up on it is, you know, and again, this is obviously, you know, if, if we remember what, what Michael was saying about Pharaoh Sanders, you know, take that, keep, keep pushing on with that you know, in terms of practice, in terms of, let's call it the, the musical education of a, of a saxophone player. We, we could even call it, think about it in terms of a certain kind of, you know, journey, so to speak, towards, towards virtuosity um, that, that maybe parallels, you know, the, the, the human, you know, journey, the, the journey of a human subject towards, towards the good. <laughs> you know, um, you know, that, 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 that modality of building, you know, um, which is, you know, on the one hand, a certain notion of education and development, but, but, but more generally, it's about what it means to picture oneself, um, you know, um, Einbildung, you know, or, you know, what, what it is to be able to picture oneself, to formulate a, a theory of oneself, a, a concept of oneself you know, as, as human, you know, um, you know, and, and so now is, is that the goal? Is that the goal of, 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 of Joe McPhee's mus musical education? You know, um, you could think about it in terms of the production of tone with regard to a saxophone, you know, and obviously I'm, I'm thinking about Joe McPhee, but I'm actually hearing Pharaoh Sanders. And I'm hearing both Joe McPhee and Pharrell Sanders as, you know, as, as in a certain sense, as direct descendants of train, of coal train, you know. Um, and so I'm thinking of those stories, you know, where, you know, I, I, don't, I think I remember reading, you know, coal train's neighbors would be leave, leaving for work in the morning and he'd be playing a scale. He'd get back that evening at seven o'clock, he'd be playing the same scale. You know, what, what was he doing? What, and then I think it is one time, um, when I was in grad school at Berkeley, the World Saxophone Quartet came uh, to give a concert and they had like a little kind of a talk, you know, like that you could go to as a student and they, you know, after they rehearsed and, and great baritone saxophonist Hammond blew it. At one point he, he was saying, he started playing this, this, you know, this sort of chord, this harmonic thing on, on the saxophone. And it wasn't any, it was just a scream or a squall, you know, and he kept saying, and, 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 and he had to actually move his body in a certain way to, to hit those notes. And he just said, see, this sounds beautiful to me, but it was not on any tempered scale. You know, it was, it was, I mean, to even call it microtonal or, or a kind of, you know, uh, atonal, microtonal, pantonal disruption of normative tone, even, but even that doesn't really get it, you know. But I guess what I'm saying is, what if it turns out that, that after the fact of attempting a kind of musical education in which you learn how to play the instrument properly, 
then what you begin to do is expropriate the instrument, right? You, you begin to take away the instrument's properties. Um, and it's, it's a stripping down of normative tone, you know, um, and you can, and I feel like you can, I, you know, I, I believe that um, in, in black music, go discourse, people would talk about this sometimes as a development of a personal sound. Um, so it, it, it gets folded into a logic and a discourse of individuation. But, but my sense of it, what I want to say, or what I think the music is asking us to say is that it's actually not about that kind of individuation. It's not about an achievement of personality. You know, it's a refusal of personality in that way that Spillers talks about, you know, in the crisis of the Negro intellectual or post-state, you know, it's, it's like this thing where it's not about sounding like yourself, it's about sounding like everything. <laughs> it's about sounding like all, you know, um, in other words, that, that the tone at that point becomes the location of an assembly, right? And, and the music then becomes about this gathering and this this renewal of a certain kind of set of habits of a of assembly, you know, to use a phrase that Stefano and I learned from our friend and comrade um, Manolo Callahan, um, and you know, and it, this is something like what you know Henry Dumas talks about in that great story, "Will the Circle Be Unbroken?" That this gathering, um, you know, um, so. So if I'm listening to McPhee, I'm not, you're not listening to some achievement of a perfection of tone. You, you're, 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 you're listening to something like the, 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 the stripping down or the breaking down of, of the oneness of tone, <laughs> you know, of the O-N-E in tone and, 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 and something, and, it, and it's, I don't know, maybe, and you put in some new letters in there, you know, like a H, R, you know, tone becomes thrown. It, it becomes, but not, not a throne you sit on, but a throwing like a, you know, you know, something happens to tone. Something happens to, 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 to those normative scales, you see, that, that, that have been imposed as, as a kind of musical rule that, you know, in which the emergence of tonality, you know, goes hand in hand with, what one might call the discovery of the human, so to speak, within a certain kind of, you know, Renaissance discourse, you know, and of course the discovery of the human is coterminous with the discovery of the new world, you know, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it just ain't nothing except a story of absolute brutality, right? So, you know, Ralph Ellison wants to say, you know, that that kind of declamatory musicality, which he can also talk about in terms of speech, he wants to say that's the moment where, you know, you be, you know, you, somehow you feel more human. Okay. And, um, and at the same time, it feels like, you know, maybe for us, we're thinking, no, oh, this is something where you feel both less than human and more than human. Okay. And, and, and you, you're in, you're in the thing that surrounds the human, right? And that refuses the human's desire, you know, to establish itself as the locus of an overview, to establish itself as the locus of dominion and and of grasp, you know. Um, and I just think, you know, you know, we we we're trying to investigate what it means to to not have to to not have to take responsibility for the human. Why should black people have to do that shit? You know, we do, ain't, ain't we had enough fucking trouble? You know what I'm saying? Why we got to do that? You know, um, and you know, um, and again, it, it's not about it's not educate it's not against education, but well, it's something you know that, that Stefano I know has been thinking about for a long time, especially with regard to Singapore, and we try to write about it in, in all incomplete. It's, it's not a disavowal of education, but it is a refusal of total education and a complete education. It, it's a, trying, to, trying to make a claim on, on, on what we call a partial education. But partial means not only incomplete, but it also means preferential. You know, we're making a preferential option for something else. Um, 
You know, sure. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just, just quickly, Fred, as you were talking about that, I was thinking, uh, particularly around the uh, this notion of, of of being surrounded by something more. I was thinking of uh, of my favorite Lord Kitchener song, which is called Bee's Melody. And if you've never heard this, this is a song, like in a lot of Lord Kitchener songs, he's actually telling you what he's doing while he's singing the song. And part of what he's always telling you that he's doing, because it's something he always did, is he wrote both to perform the Calypso in a Kaiso tent and for his song to be rearranged by, um, by a steel band conductor um, to be played in the big steel band. And in Bee's melody, he's going up a hill and he starts getting stung by bees. They're literally surrounding him. And at first he tries to run away and then he stops and he says, but wait, they're making a sweet melody these bees as they sing. <laughs> and he runs back up the hill to get some more of this thing. So literally the music is already surrounding him, coming through him, but actually going back out to the steel pans where it will be rearranged, right? In these huge, like percussive melodies, right? It's not like the stuff you see, you know, on cruise ship. This is, you know, they make the trucks bounce once they get going. So he he, he actually is narrating being the person through which some this music is flowing from the bees to the pans. Um, and, and of course, made me, made me think of, uh, that's how I thought of it as you were you were talking about this. So sorry, I just had it in the room with that. No, it's thinking about Pharaoh in that way, right? And the first time I ever met him was back in like in the late 90s and I had to pick him up on the airport, right? And the first thing I went through this like real long, like bout with anxiety is about what do you listen to in the car with Pharaoh Saunders, right? <laughs> like, you know, you can't put him on because that seems stupid, right? So I picked him up from O'Hare and we were driving and I'd put on, uh, Gene Ammons, right? And he was, he was, you know, Pharaoh's not a verbal person, right? He's just sitting there just riding and listening. And then it got to Gene Ammons has on, on I think it's on the, the Hitting the Jug album, maybe he plays Confirmation and Pharaoh had never heard it before. And as soon as he played the first notes, Pharaoh just went, oh, and told me to pull over, right? He made me pull over to the side of the, 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 the Kennedy Expressway. He made me listen, he listened to it twice, said, okay, go ahead and drive. Cause he had never heard, he heard something that like that speaks to this notion of like you're saying Stefano this thing like these bees hovering around because he's heard it all before right there was something particular that he heard that he wanted to hear uh, twice right he needed to hear it twice to make sure it was what he thought it was and then it speaks to this question of tonality right which makes me think of what what I know about you know Mandarin is nothing but what I do know about it is his tonal right to speak to this, the, the linguistic tradition that, that Christian was bringing to the conversation right and so much about what Blewett was up to and Farrell's up to is to is to tell us what we got wrong about tone, right? To say what you thought was the proper tone for that is not the proper tone for it. And it reminds me of the way in which a vocalist will tease tone. Like if you listen to Sam Cooke say Jesus, right? He's got a, a thousand different ways to, to say those two syllables, right? Jesus, Jesus, G, like he over and over, he just plays with it and pulls on it in the same way, right? It reminds me so much about what, what these, and I think Fred, you call it the proper education of a saxophone player or something like that, right? Gets to the point where it's a, it's to, to, to know the tone, but then be like, okay, this is where it's got it, where it's wrong. Or this is where the tone needs this additional thing to express what I need to say in that way, right? And, and Blue, it has to, you know, his body was contorted because he was, from the time he was a kid, he was carrying around a heavy baritone saxophone. So it even, messed up his shoulders right so his whole body is related in a particular way to the baritone where it was it was a, it was part of his embodiment and so at the end when when blue was in the hospital right he had fallen and had laid on his left arm for a couple of days right when he had a stroke and he couldn't play anymore so i had talked to him and i asked him what he needed in the hospital he said i need some music to be sent to me so i was like what do you want to hear? And I was like, you know, he's going to say, you know, he want to hear or Ned. He want, he said he wanted to hear the Isley Brothers, right? He's like, I want to like send me like the Isley Brothers to listen to, right? And it was like he wanted to recreate like Saturday sitting in St. Louis watching Soul Train basically as he knew that he was at the end, right? He had run out and he couldn't play anymore because, you know, his left arm was gone from that perspective, right? And so 
it was it was getting back to it, it reminded me of him saying that he wanted to get back to those tones that the Isley brothers are putting out that help him understand everything he's doing later on. That's just that what you're talking about where he's contorting himself to get that thing that sounds pretty to him or sounds beautiful to him, right? And that to me is that to me defines a type of fugitivity. And then the question with, with these kind of talkbacks like at Berkeley is he's doing what I was asking the question. He's helping you develop a fugitive, a system of fugitive cognition so you can hear it, right? He's like, this is what you need to be hearing about this, right? Or this is why this, is is beautiful or not right or it's beautiful in the fact that it's not what you would traditionally think the round tone of that horn is supposed to deliver you because it's a uh it becomes an embodied practice in that way right the kind of inextricable linkage and i mean pharaoh he plays around with mouthpieces and reads endlessly man it's like you know you've been doing this for so long he's got he takes them out of his bag he's just got them laying out there you're like and during the performance, he goes back in the back and still is messing with the reed and the and the and the mouthpiece to kind of get this thing that he's trying to hear. That I guarantee you, no one else knows what what he comes back and he's got it just right, and you can't even tell what the difference is. Because he asked me one time, he's like, "Which one did you like better?" I'm like, uh, "The second one, right?" I just like, made it up because it just, it was completely immaterial, right? There's no, I couldn't tell the difference between because I couldn't properly hear it, right? So to get to that question of how that cog system of cognition or the conditions had not been met yet for me to be able to properly hear what it is he was doing or wanted me to hear. You know, I mean, it's, I've always wondered why it is that when people you know, I mean, I'm to, I'm interested in all these things that I don't know anything about, you know, and it produces this condition where I, I'm asking naive, you know, questions, um, which are at least, or I guess to not be disingenuous, I think I'm asking deep questions that maybe these people who know shit say that's just naive, you know. Um, but the either deep or naive question that I have for cognitive science is, is why would you ever think that you could figure out what's going on in the brain by studying one brain at a time? You know, like what why would why would you think that cognition would actually manifest itself as something that occurs in individual units, in individual cognitive units? And and that's just a way of that question is a way of maybe saying, you know, that if if they're creating new cognitive, you know, systems or new 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 notions of the cognitive, so that we can listen, if if it seems to me that, you know, and I, and I know this is what Stefano was saying earlier today too, that the that the one prerequisite for any of it is that it ain't about listening by yourself, you know. It's, you know, it's not about, there is no listening alone, you know, um, but, uh, but I, you know, I, I'm just noticing that there's a whole bunch of questions over here in the question thing. So I just feel like we should, maybe we should try to, to look at some of these questions, you know, um, that people are asking. I, I don't want yeah. folks to feel like we weren't, we weren't paying attention to them. Um, yeah. Oh, there's I, that crept up on me. How many? <laughs> how many there are? Um, yeah. Let's uh, start and and ask a few. I just want to add just one sentence that you know I've spent a lot of time you know talking with Michael and reading his work as a friend. And this is the first time we've met, but I've spent time reading both of your collective and individual works. And it was really, uh, Fred, you mentioned George Lewis's tone burst. Um, I forget where you mentioned it. And so, you know, I never heard it before and I put it on and that was an epiphanic, like so much that I was working through cognitively, trying to follow the discourse of, you know, the traditions you're arguing in and against and lateral to, you know, it, the tone burst was that moment, the glissant phrase, consent not to be a single being just kind of, flickered up and through me and so 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 in other words like that these different registers 
at which things make or are felt or are um, embodied in different ways. Um, I just wanted to say it was the tone burst that really spoke to me through your writing at the, as well. Anyway, um, so let's work through some of these questions. Um, so there's a, I'll just, I'm just gonna work from backwards because there's a question to all of you at the here. So could uh, Michael, okay. Um, could Michael, Stefano and Fred, if they would like to talk a little about the generative time of practice and study, I was thinking in terms of refusal of refusal towards some kind of temporal deconstruction of teleological eschatology, eschatology of capitalist Newtonian time is a question. Um, from, so I don't know if it's not anonymous, should I read the questioner's name? I've never actually done this before as a moderator. Um, yeah. hmm? It's up to you. Yeah, All right, Yeah. That, that was a question from James Miller. Um, we'll take it, uh, maybe, you, uh, maybe I'll just read off a few questions and then we can, we can uh, do it from there. So from Mohammed Mia, on the topic of repetition performance practice, I'm recalling Sawyer's engagement with Islamic ritual roles and Malcolm X's embodied political philosophy. Um, okay, maybe we can start with those two and then I'll just uh, do my job as moderator <laughs> and read through the rest of them and try to synthesize something. Um, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a run at the trying to combine the kind of two, right? I think for me, Islam and, and the the notion of, of the repetition, right? So the repetitive prayer ritual every day, right? Creates just that type of thing, right? Whether is it, because it, it's not, you can't be a non-performing Muslim, right? It's, it, you have to perform something like, you, you, like I'm basically a non-performing Christian, right? I don't go to church, but I'm still Christian. It occurs to me that you can't be Muslim and non-performing, right? So the performance of the activity uh, becomes itself the practice of, of something like a relationship to the higher being, right? To, to higher forms of power. So without that, I think to wonder if that's possible or how I'm curious how that destabilizes in Malcolm's practice, what I argued was, Islam becomes destabilizing to Western systems of power, particularly because it has its own system of temporality, right? Where five times a day, it, it during what is normally the work day, you have to stop and think about God, right? One time a year, you spend an entire month not doing the things everybody else is doing, and it shifts itself around depending upon a relationship to the moon rather than a relationship to the to the Gregorian or Roman calendar. And the third thing for me is it also creates a disruption to to the point where the the point of attention becomes the need to know which way mecca is right so you're no longer concerned in whatever political environment that you live in you're not concerned with the uptown or the downtown you're concerned with which way is mecca first and foremost and that happens five times a day and for an entire month right so i think that that creates a type of fugitive time with respect to fugitive temporality with respect to the way western societal order is constructed around the Judeo-Christian tradition or around the capitalist notion of the workday. So I think it's disruptive. And my argument was that Malcolm disrupts both of those with that type of practice. And I, and I think that's the way I would situate my answer to that question and, and, and the first one about an alternative temporal practice or fugitive temporality. Do you, know, do you all want to elaborate on that or should I go to a different question or? Um, since there's a, a, a question related um, to time, I was actually, um, if I could also throw in my own question and then move on to, to another one. I'm really, um, kind of obsessed with both how Fred and Stefano talk about communism in different ways, which kind of, again, uh, scintillates in different moments of your conversations and texts. Um, and uh, especially in the dialogue in the undercommons, um, or Stefano, you describe communism 
partially again as a practice of giving up something i think in your words of giving up anything like a kind of sovereign self-determination or a dispossession of ourselves um and so i i i hear that and what i love about that is i think in a way it's 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 an anti or at least non-marxist understanding of communism because i think marx or at least a, a reading of marx is in this eschatological tradition where the outcome of which is a kind of redemption of unalienated labor. And I know, Fred, uh, in many passages, you talk about kind of unsuturing practice from these attachments to the figure of redemption or the kind of overcoming of, of alienation. So to connect to the question that um, um, Michael was just addressing like um, is part of the problem that so much of political theory, um, including a Marxist um, uh, strength, including a Marxist vein of it is attached to a kind of notion of eschatological time. And then there's also the capitalist time that Michael talked about. I'll just throw that out there um, and then read a few other questions as well. Uh, from Lily Epstein, um, is the fugitive aesthetic necessarily rooted in an Afro-pessimist lens? In that case, if I'm hearing it correctly, there is some attempt to locate the fugitive in the society where the fugitive's existence is always already that of the not human. Rich Blint asks, in our condition of contingency and precarity, how do we speak a more true word about ourselves refuse to be lost balls and tall weeds, as spillers might have it, and find our own tone to engage in the new acts of creation that Baldwin demanded. How do we make this a central concern of Black study? Okay, I think that's enough questions for, at this point, we'll come back to the other questions, don't worry. Um, but just um, to uh, open, reopen the conversation and mute myself with the sound effect that Fred was mentioning earlier. <laughs> Um, well, um, with so many different threads, um, you know, with regard to Rich, Rich Blint's question, Rich, I, I mean, I, this probably won't be a very satisfactory answer, but I was, you know, I, I think I probably, I think I, I think I know what you're talking about, and I, and I'm, I'm, 99.9% .9 certain that I'm totally with you. I, I wouldn't use the term true word, probably, you know. Um, and I wouldn't use the term our tone. And yet I feel like there's some other words that I would use that agree with what I think you mean when you use those terms. Okay. Um, and you know, and one way to think about black study would be that it would just be, you know, how we hang out and talk with each other as we, you know, as we work through those terms, you know, um, not maybe to find a single one that works or to find a true word or a single tone or to, to adjudicate which one is the most appropriate, but, but you know, how, how we would play all those tones, how we would work all those tones, um, all those, all those words, um, you know, and, and within that context, those concerns that you talk about are, if they're not the central concerns of black study, then it ain't black study. Is something else. Maybe, maybe, maybe implicit in your question is a distinction between black study and black studies. And, and, and maybe another way to phrase the question would be that the specific conditions of contingency and precarity that we face right now, which are conditions of contingency and precarity by way of inclusion, right? It's the specific modalities of contingency and precarity that 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 emerge as a function of inclusion, right? 
um, maybe maybe what's at stake is is that you know sometimes it might seem like like maybe like like maybe black studies has to reorient itself towards or towards those central concerns um, but black study is simply that is 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 as far as I think we understand it is 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 just simply those concerns that concern that's that's what that's what black study is um, uh, and then with regard to the to the afro pessimists the question about afro pessimism um well, it's interesting that the grammar of the question um, is interesting. I'm just I'm sitting here trying to try to figure out how come I don't really have a problem with the term the black aesthetic, but I sort of do have a problem with the term the fugitive aesthetic. I'm okay with fugitive aesthetics. The fugitive aesthetic, that that makes me nervous, you know. And I think it's because the term the fugitive makes me nervous. I don't have a problem with fugitivity. I, I, I don't, you know, I think, and this was again, this is something that was implicit and also at the same time explicit in, in, in Stefano's first remark. There's nobody's fugitive by themselves, you know? Um, there's no individual figure of the fugitive. It's not, no such thing, no such entity. Um, now, one of the questions that might emerge with regard to Afro-pessimism would be, um, how certain iterations of Afro-pessimism, I, I won't say all, cause it's such a richly internally differentiated discourse, but how there might be certain iterations of Afro-pessimism which are concerned with something like what we might call the recovery of the individual figure. Um, and, and, and probably maybe that would be the most fundamental place of a divergence between, between Afro-pessimism and, and whatever you wanna call what we're doing. Um, but you know, it's a divergence within kinship at least at least from, 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 I think, from our perspective. Um, and it's a divergence within, within a kinship of common study. Okay. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, another way to put it is, it's a divergence within a general antagonism and not the relative antagonism that, uh, that some folks like to, to, to focus on. And, and certainly not the kinds of relative individuated antagonisms, which which actually constitute again, by way of inclusion, part of the the precarity and contingency which has been visited upon Black studies in the in the contemporary moment. You know, we we fighting, but we ain't fighting with them. Or another way to put it is, we fighting with them, but we ain't fighting with them. <laughs> or you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Stefano, please. Well, I, I realize your question was also kind of hanging out there around <clears throat> ways in which Fred and I conceive of communism. I was waiting for a second to see if Fred came around to that because. The other day we were talking and he did really a beautiful um, take on Marx and our relationship. So I, I was kind of uh, waiting for uh, him to come back around to that part of the uh, performance. But, um, but, he, but in absence of that, um, I'm just gonna step forward with, with a, just a short thing about that, which is to say that, you know, I think our understanding of Marxism and of communism uh, comes through the work of Cedric Robinson. And um, so <clears throat> as opposed to being in a frame where we might say, as you were, I think, sort of saying, Christian, that one moves from the, the problem of individual alienated labor to the, the collective subject, um, we just 
uh, have a different frame for thinking about that, right? So, um, you know, starting with his anthropology of Marxism, what he stakes out for us is, is, is that it, it wasn't inevitable that, we, that, 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 that Europe in particular and eventually the world would have to fight a certain fight, a class struggle through the, these figures of the individual workers who then come together to form the corporate. Um, and it wasn't inevitable, but once it happened, it was accompanied by the corporate, which is to say from the very beginning, it was accompanied by race. Race being another way of thinking the corporate, the, the whole, the complete. Uh, and, and so for us, Robinson helps us from there and then through terms of order to think that we have to get away from both of those poles from the corporate pole where everything comes together in the party or in the revolution or et cetera, you know? Um, and, and from the pole of, of our liberation, our individual liberation, the end of the exploitation up to the end of this, the stealing of our labor. You know, we, if, if you don't start with the idea that it's yours, it can't be stolen from you. And so starting, Somewhere else means starting with this, with the, with the notion of the incomplete, which we get from, from, from Professor Robinson, of course, and and that incomplete then does not um, require corporatization. If you're incomplete, it doesn't mean that you seek out the other person to complete yourself. It doesn't mean that you seek out the rest of the movement to complete something. Uh, instead, what it means is that you introduce incompleteness into every would be corporate form, um, undermining and resisting that, that, that very idea. So we, we naturally have to come out with a kind of communism that doesn't base itself either around the corporate or around the individual access to it, which is unfortunately sort of, you know, um, encapsulated in this very seductive notion of, of uh, you know, fishing in the morning and reading philosophy in the afternoon or wherever else, you know, as if, because it sounds like, well, that's the kind of thing I would like to do as if it were an individual activity that became possible once you were individually freed as part of a, a, the right corporate, finally, the right corporation has come along, you know, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's prepared to, to offer you everything you want, you know, um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm always, you know, I always think that there's a possibility of helping, you know, of, of studying with anybody who, who, <laughs> studying with anybody who is interested uh, in, in any kind of notion of communism and, uh, and part of what it means to, to introduce incompleteness is, is to find a way to, to study with people who, who maybe don't want to study with you, who maybe, you know, um, um, feel that they already have some sort of uh, complete or corporate um, um, location for themselves. Uh, and so it's, it's a practice too, um, is, is all I'm saying. It's a practice and not just a, a, a conceptual uh, tool that we we borrow from Professor Robinson, as I think it was for him, you know, as well. Thank you so much for uh, for that. Um, to keep going with the questions, uh, we have one from Ellis Sawyer, um, who is curious about the role of fugitive cognition and temporality in something like hip hop. Um, and could you all riff for a little bit about the fugitive aesthetic in hip hop? And then Julia Drescher asks perhaps a naive question, if the conditions to hear have not been met, what might the player be listening to hearing? Not to oversimplify in parentheses. So maybe since those both are addressing music and listening, um, we can deal with those questions together. Yeah, I think for me to, to, to go to the last question first, right? I'm not convinced that the player is actually necessarily aware of what's happening at the time, right? I'm, what I'm proposing is that there's an atmosphere of force around 
black subjectivity that produces certain sounds, right? And I'm saying that part of that atmosphere of coercive uh, pressure also creates the conditions for not being able to hear or see certain sounds. But at the same time, I think it also, like I said first, creates a condition to produce them. So I think there's an asynchronous, there's an asynchronous nature, an asynchronous relationship between production and hearing where both in certain instances, you may run into a position where the performer and the hearer and their awareness of what's going on, this kind of notion of cognition that, that Fred mentioned before, right? Because I've always been curious about what the cognitive side people have to say about using the brain to study the brain, right? Seems like that's gonna cause all kinds of problems too at the same time. But I'm saying that, that in this situation, it may be this type of communal listening or communal system of confusion that helps through a type of practice of studying what has been produced to then be able to drag everybody to the point of understanding what's been produced which is a long way around the saying that I'm not sure that anybody knows what they're doing necessarily until it reaches the point of, of the conditions being met for all those places, all those people or subjects to meet in a space of, of communal study to answer this question, right? And I think that for me to, to get to the question about hip hop, right? And the fugitivity of it, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about like the like I just the other day I was watching the the documentary about Biggie, right? I don't know if people have seen this, right? It's like and it was fascinating to me because for some reason when he was there were people who had pictures of them with him when they were like five years old. And they were coming forward to be like, here I am with him in third grade. And he has this like brightness about him, right? In these pictures, right? This and I can I can pretty much be sure that there's no one in the world that is keeping a picture of me when I was five years old in their house that's not related to me, right? And there are people who related to me who probably don't even care to have pictures of me when they're five years old because they just don't care. So there's something going on about that presence, right? And it becomes a type of of a way of being that I think in, that he adopts both in his personal, physical comportment, the way he displays himself, the way he he functions and then the fugitivity of the way he produces his art right like you know to you know some of the things that he would say man it's like you know he says this one rhyme he says get in that ass quick fast like ramadan right and it's like the complexity of that statement means he's got this complete awareness of all those things at the same time but also puts them in a framework that's discernible where hip-hop becomes the vehicle for transmitting that information so I'm not sure if if hip hop, capital hip H, capital H hip hop, is so much a style of music as opposed to a, a system of transmission of information, or maybe that's what music is, right? It's a way to transmit a particular type of information. I think there's a type of hip hop that's about performing the the structure. I think there's a a, a form of hip hop that is becomes a delivery system, right? And if you if you can listen properly to it and you have and you have what Arthur Jaffa says, if you have properly humbled yourself to the form, right? Then I think then you have the possibility of being able to hear exactly what's going on. If not, I think you're just, you're on the surface kind of floating on top of it and you don't get the, the depth of, of everything. What, what I said, Allison's talking about, we're hurting, bleeding and, 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 and just, you know, hoping at the same time. Right, and I think all those things to me become the the complexity of the future, of the aesthetic that we would call the hip hop aesthetic. That I think is within what Fred says is is his comfort with something like the black aesthetic that seems to have those different lines within it, right? And that seems to be one particular one that I'm I'm curious to figure out whether it is uh, fish or fowl in the way it's a delivery system or actually a practice or both at the same time. Well, if it's a practice that makes intermittent deliveries, you know, I mean, um, which are which are in a certain sense non non essential, um, but which can certainly be very beautiful and extraordinarily, you know, seductive. Um, you know, and this 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 is just played out generally in the music, you know, because I have been seduced and have fallen in love so many times with so many sounds and at the same time 
studying the music is I think coming to grips with the fact that the music is the making of the music. <laughs> it's, it's not the sound. Um, the sound, you know, is the appearance which tells of the making of the music. And it really freaks me out to be channeling Plato, you know, by way of Wallace Stevens, but sometimes you just don't. <laughs> uh, well, as someone once said, who was seemingly intent on putting me in my place, sometimes you just don't know who you who you are indebted to, you know, but on the other hand, sometimes you do, you know, and it's just some shit you got to deal with, you know, but um, but at any rate, uh, with regard to hip hop specifically, um, this question of, of, you know, practice versus delivery system, which again is its own way, takes us back to Allen Iverson, you know, um, it's really rich, you know, and, and I guess I kind of tend to think that, you know, Biggie's a crucially important figure in the history of the music, because I think for me, Biggie is asking us to call into question the ethic, the primacy of the delivery system. And, and it, but it's done so by very, in a very specific way, by way of the, the specificities of his enunciation. Okay. Um, There's this great, great musician and, and poet and thinker named Jerome Ellis, who, from the perspective of someone who is a stutterer and who has a, you know, a profound disfluency, he's asking us to think more generally about disfluency in Black culture, in Black utterance. Um, and, and, and what I guess I would want to say is that, you know, Let's say that delivery has something to do with fluency and practice has something to do with an, a constant approach, a constant sort of preferential option for disfluency, right? That, it, that in black music, it seems to me, you don't practice in order to become more fluent, you practice in order to become less fluent, okay? If, if what we mean by fluency is a certain kind of normativity. Um, and, and so, um, I still will never say anything other than that Rakim is the greatest rapper in the history of the music. I'm just not going to ever be able to say anything other than that. But what I also recognize is that um, maybe what that means is that I'm saying that you know, he's the greatest deliverer of content in the history of hip hop. And, and, and to me, the shift from, from Rakim to, to Biggie is a shift from a, a clarity of enunciation in the delivery of content to somebody who is cultivating, not just, not, not, not avoiding, but rather cultivating the slur. Um, you know, um, this cultivation of the slur is really way more intense. Maybe it's a bad boy thing, you know, seriously, because Mace cultivates the slur in, in ways that are, that are even more pronounced, obviously, you know, but, but what, but, but to me, you know, Biggie's in an, in an instant, Biggie's the prophet of trap, right? Where, you know, that, that cultivation of slur the cultivation of disfluency, you know, is is really, really pr pr pronounced, so to speak. And it's done so in the interest of, of reminding us that the music is the making of the music. Okay. Um, and it's the, you know, it's the, it's the existential condition out of which the music emerges, you know. Um, so, and I think you could obviously you know, talk about all of that with regard to with regard to fugitivity. This also is something that I'm trying to learn from 
from from Lorenzo Moten, um, you know, who is constantly giving me a tutorial on 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 various lils, as I call them, the, the you know the the the, the proliferation of, of of lils, right? A baby, lot of baby way, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to learn. I'm doing the best I can. Since we have just a few minutes left, um, would uh, Michael, Stefano, Fred, any thoughts to kind of conclude today's um, absolutely uh, wonderful uh, discussion? Um, and if uh, we didn't get to your question, I, um, I am deeply uh, sorry about that, but we have them and, um, and um, they're noted. Uh, but yeah, so with the few minutes left, would anybody like to say a few final concluding thoughts? Just want to say thank you, and that it was fun, you know, and uh, and uh, and I'm going back on mute now. But thank you so much. Thank you, Christian and Michael and Steve. Um, I'd also like to uh, say thank you, uh, but I also thought, you know, since we are looking at these uh, these aesthetic examples, uh, you know, we should remember that this has been really a, a fucking horrible year for losing people um, who presented various forms of the fugitive aesthetic to us. Uh, and I, I was just thinking about, um, for instance, you, Roy, who just died recently, um, Bunny Whaler, the list goes on and on, but um, I think it's a, you know, it's a moment just to to recall what they have done for us, what they prepared for us, and even though I I think Michael's right that the conditions are not yet there, um, there's been a lot of people who've been helping us to get to those conditions who who we lost this year. So uh, that's that's in my mind as as we talk about future sympathetics. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and um, I hope we get a chance to, to continue our conversations. Yeah, I obviously want to say thank you as well, right? It's been such a really fun opportunity to kind of talk through this. And I think to just what Stefano was saying, right, I imagine that at some point when the conditions have met, all these things that we've heard will all come together in some like weird, like single noise, right? That like carries all that information at the same time, just washes over us, right? And just reveals everything at the same time, right? And that's, you know, not to be, you know, all kind of, you know, revelations about it, right? It just feels like that kind of thing, right? And this moment to of catastrophe that we've lived through in in this the last year, this long year that that just keeps, you know, echoing forward with these losses, right? I think all of that is is part and parcel of us struggling to figure out how to meet the conditions to be able to to, to take stock and about and properly understand what it is that we've been listening to all this time right from you know dating back to equiano kind of forward right these kind of you know utterances that have that i think at some point will will be combined to a single coherent statement for us right that then helps us then go back and listen again and with a new system of kind of cognition so this really helped me with uh, some of the things i've been thinking about so i really appreciate it and hope we can you know do some again and and thanks to the audience as well for their kind attention. Well, I think on that note, that's a, a perfect place to end. And just again, I am truly grateful to Stefano, Fred and Michael and everybody else in the audience and people involved in making the event and planning up to it. And um, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you again. Uh, this has also been just extraordinarily helpful for my own thinking and um, and thinking together and collectively uh, with others. So it is almost exactly four. So I guess we can end here. Amazing book. <laughs> <laughs>